My next guest is American writer, historian, actor and essayist whose acid wit has made him a hugely popular and indeed unpopular commentator. I like Gore when he's on this show. He says what is on his mind. Mr. Vidal has become a cultural icon. Prolific American novelist, playwright, screenwriter, historian, essayist. Conversationalist, actor, humorist and sometime political candidate. Would you welcome please Mr. Gore Vidal. From We Own This Town, this is Vidalatry. A look at the wit and wisdom in the spoken words of Gore Vidal. I'm Ryan Briegel. As the 1990s came to a close, America was still coming to terms with the impeachment trial of Bill Clinton, which had ended in an acquittal in 1999. As he had voiced before, Gorvidal felt that the sex lies of candidates shouldn't have any influence on politics, and for once, it seemed like the majority of Americans agreed. Gore spoke with Thames Television's Gloria Hunterford in early 2000 about the effects of the sex scandal on politics in general. Do you think the whole sort of Clinton-Lewinsky thing, do you think people just got, in a way, so switched off politics? I don't think that bothered them. It bothered the media, and it bothered the people behind the media who put up the money for these campaigns. But at the height of the impeachment of the president, with all of that scandal going on, he maintained 60 to 70 percent popularity with the people. And the pundits on television were horrified. There was one who used to go on every night and say, Where is outrage? Where is outrage? Well, of course, it was outrageous. He was on television (laughs) saying, where is outrage? But it was... uh, The people were behind him, and they didn't like the scandal. They didn't want to hear about it. And the press misread them. So the press has been trying to recover, because he maintained 70% popularity. The press dropped to 10%, and big business to 12%, which is not an endorsement in either case. And this is true. According to a CBS News poll, Bill Clinton had his highest approval rating immediately after the impeachment trial, and he left office with a 68% approval rating, matching those of Reagan and Franklin Roosevelt. Gloria next asked Gore about his previous experiences with Hillary Clinton. I understand that Hillary actually came to you at one point, you know, way, way back when he was when Clinton was first elected to In ask 93. your advice. Yeah, she came with uh, her daughter and her mother at the end of their stay. This is in Italy, in Ravello. And as she was leaving, it was the first time I had met her, and she looked up at me and she said, you know, meeting you has been the high point of our trip. And I thought, well, very nice. For my mother. <laughs> <laughs> it has come to this, I said to myself. It is people's mothers who say it's a high point. Was she, was she really on a mission to ask your advice about how she should be as First Lady of America? She was very curious about Mrs. Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt, whom I had known, and, of course, about Jackie, whom I was sort of brought up with. We should explain Jackie Kennedy, of course. And was she actually what else? No, she had, we had the same stepfather. Yes. And Jackie had just died before she came, and uh, Hillary had gone to the funeral. And I said, I, I, I thought it ironic. I didn't really say so, but... The Jackie, who in her life never did anything for anyone, I mean, she was superbly selfish, but very charming and a wonderful mother. But you asked her to do something for the people, and she just said, let Ethel do it, you know. She would pass it along to somebody else. And here she dies, beloved by a nation, by the world. And poor Hillary Clinton who has just been trying to give the United States a national health service, something every civilized country has, but we don't, trying to give something to the people, and she was being hated. And I thought, now, there's something wrong with this society, that this exclusive, rather selfish lady is beloved, Mm. and somebody's doing good Mm. is disliked. No, I think she's done a good job. Do you think she would get in as as a senator? Oh, I think so, yes. She's a bit overqualified for that post, but uh, I think she'll be very good at it. Why do you think she wants it so badly? I think that uh, she's political, and she has served, been a loyal helpmeet to her husband, and now she wants to stretch her wings. She's a very good lawyer, too. And... uh, in the back of many of these ladies' minds, who will be the first woman president? We could do a lot worse than Hillary. 
So that might be your prediction for way down the line a bit. I'd say for eight years from now, maybe, yes. <laughs> and as we know, Gore's eight-year calculation was correct. The election in November 2000 was a subject that Gore Vidal spent much of the first decade of the 21st century talking about. As you will see, he believed that George W. Bush's victory in 2000 was fraudulent and undeserved. Bush's opponent, Al Gore, did win the popular vote, but the electoral college votes in Florida, enough to make a difference for either candidate, were contested. In the end, on December 12, 2000, the U.S. Supreme Court finally declared the Florida electoral votes would be given to Bush, and he was officially named the president-elect. Then, in the 2004 election, there were reported a number of irregularities at voting precincts in Ohio, everything from voter suppression to voting machine manipulation. In fact, out of the 50 states, only one state, North Dakota, reported that they had no Election Day issues, and five states reported more than 1,000 issues each. When Bush won the Electoral College votes in Ohio that year, you can imagine Gore felt, as many did, that it was the 2000 election all over again. Gore voiced his cries of fraud when he appeared on The Henry Rollins Show on IFC in 2007, giving the 81-year-old Gore an opportunity to take a look back at the two terms of George W. Bush. What do you think has been the biggest affront to democracy with this administration? Well, the fact that it has ne never been properly elected by the people. Fraud got the men in 2000 and 2004, another fraud, maintained them in power. So really it's an illegitimate government. It was not the choice of the American people. American people don't make mistakes like that. We do dumb things or we, we're negligent often, but uh, we would never pick. Can you imagine George Washington being in favor of preemptive wars? Hmm that you attack your neighbor. We did that only once in our history before these jokers, and that was 1846 when we attacked Mexico in order to... Get California. Get California. Here we're sitting in the middle of stolen Mexican land here. After the election of 2004, John Conyers, a longtime member of the U.S. House of Representatives, put together the recorded testimony of elected officials, voting machine company employees, poll watchers, and various voters, both Republican and Democrat, to try and figure out what went wrong in Ohio. Published in 2005 under that very name, What Went Wrong in Ohio, the Conyers Report on the 2004 presidential election, Gore felt it was an important document to show the problems that occurred that year and to shine a light on ideas about getting it right the next time. In fact, Gore wrote the foreword to the report, and Henry Rollins asked why that was important to him. You wrote the foreword to the Conyers report mm -hmm. on the Ohio votes. Ohio, swing state, very important in the 2004 election. A lot of people have a lot of questions and criticisms about the voting in that state. Why did you write the preface and what's important to know about what happened in Ohio? Well, Conyers, who was the um, ranking Democrat on the Judiciary Committee in the House of Representatives, he couldn't call witnesses. He couldn't have hearings because the Republicans don't allow you to examine anything they do. They won't even let you discuss it because they, they cut you off. So on his own, he went up to Ohio with some good detectives and lawyers and so forth to see what had actually happened. Well, what went wrong there was everything that you can dream of. There were people were not told there was an election. People were told they couldn't vote because they were felons and they'd had a jaywalking offense against them, which is, you know, like a capital offense. And so the book went unnoticed. Now, the second, the media, is totally corrupt, as ours is. And the bigger the media, the greater the corruption. The less apt you are to be noticed when you come in with the bad news that Ohio's election was fixed, as was Florida's four years before that. So that's how I got there. Anyway, I came to know, at least over the telephone, Congressman Conyers, who's now the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, and I hope he'll be watching us and send out a few subpoenas, you know, to we hope. get people to chat about what they have done wrong. Only nine months into George W. Bush's first presidential term, we had the terrorist attacks on September 11th. 
Bush would many times during his two terms refer to himself as a wartime president. I became something that no president should ever want to be, a wartime president. Or sometimes just a war president. I think the people understand, I'm a war president. I make decisions here in the Oval Office uh, in foreign policy matters with war on my mind. And this term clearly infuriated Gore Vidal. When he spoke to Robert F. Kennedy Jr., Bobby Kennedy's son, on the radio show Ring of Fire in 2006, Gore explained why. How does it strike you as an essayist, as a man of letters, that we have a president who says he doesn't like to read or write? Well, thank God he doesn't write. Um, that he can't read is, uh, I don't know, some people say that he has a dyslexia, which is no fault of his, but it's certainly a president who has no interest in the people of the country. Every day you see that, just the blankness on his face if he isn't ready for a question. You try to get him on, on New Orleans, you know, re rebuilding it. We're going to fight terrorism. I'm wartime president. I'm wartime president. He just keeps yapping away like a terrier. <laughs> and he isn't a wartime president because there is no war. He can't just declare a war on terror. terror that war on terror is a metaphor, like a war on dandruff. There's nothing, you can't do anything about it. There's no country. You can only have a war on another nation. And he hasn't got around to that yet. He's been aggressive. He's knocked down two countries. And we, we may allow him to do it for a third or fourth. But I suspect by then we've been stopped. And when he goes on about inherent powers, he has enumerated powers, not inherent. He knows nothing about the law. He knows nothing about the Constitution. And it's not his fault. But it's our fault for allowing the stumble bump to say these things and to do these things and to talk about preemptive wars against other countries that have done us no harm. We should all be in a state of absolute shame that this thing is president. In 2005, Gore revised an old television play from 1956, originally called Honor, and renamed it On the March to the Sea. Taking place during the Civil War, this new version was produced for a theatrical reading at Duke University that year. When Gore appeared on the radio program The State of Things, it gave him the opportunity to do promotion for the event while drawing attention to Bush's inexperiences and mistakes in handling what happened on September 11th. Well, you have been uh, an outspoken critic of, of the current war in Iraq and the Bush administration in other, uh, of, in others of your works. If someone were to see on the march to the sea, would they see any glimmer of that criticism in this new incarnation of the play? Oh, yes. You know, war is war, and one of the problems with the, our current generation of leaders, if we can use such a noun, uh, is that they have never been exposed to war. My generation was. When I was 17, I enlisted in the Army, went to the Pacific, spent three years, Many of my friends were killed, and uh, I ended up with a bad leg. Well, we knew quite a lot about war, and, if, and the, as they were trying to get us to go to war over Iraq in order to get greater oil supplies for certain corporations, my generation, uh, we older people, the veterans of World War II and of Korea, we were something like 80, 90 percent against going into Iraq. We knew you don't do things like that casually. Iraq had done nothing to us. We were in no danger, so they invented a danger. That's, that's the new tactic. You pretend there's a vicious enemy who's going to blow you up in the night. So they kept saying that uh, Osama bin Laden, together with Saddam Hussein, had been responsible for 9-11. Well, Osama bin Laden was, Saddam Hussein wasn't, but our rulers wanted us to go after the second largest oil reserves in the world, which are in Iraq. But it's considered treason to even whisper that. As George W. Bush's second term was coming to a close, the idea of impeachment was brought up by many politicians, and Gore discussed this with Henry Rollins. What do you think of the idea of impeachment of President Bush? Because that, that is, I rarely hear anyone talk about impeaching Cheney, but it was always on talk radio or in op-eds is to impeach President Bush, yes or no. And some people say 
There's only like 18 months to go. Let's just get him out of there. It'll take too much time. It won't be effective. Yeah, but he can get work. us blown up in the next 18 months. I'm a wartime president. I'm a wartime president. I mean, when that little thing starts to strut around, wartime president. There is no war. Why doesn't somebody stop him? Where's the war other than what you make? Yeah. What Bush has done is put every American at risk. Wherever you live, wherever you work, you have to be blown up in the night by everything he's done wrong to enrage Islam, the Arab world. The Arabs didn't declare war on the United States. That is an invention of the uh, oil and gas junta, which is in control of our politics. They want us to believe that. They hate it when we, people like me compare them to Adolf Hitler, but they're just like Hitler. I was alive in the 30s. I was very much aware of what was going on. Hitler would always start out, Sudeten Germans are being murdered in Czechoslovakia. We must invade to save our fellow countrymen. Unser Volk. We must save them from the wicked Czechs. Czechs hadn't done a damn thing. He did the same thing with Poland. He did the same whenever he was on the attack. Now they have a new number. I see, you know, village idiots like McCain. I mean, he should be put away somewhere. Talking about bombing I Iran. Yeah. Boy, he's so gutsy, you know. <laughs> and in honor of the end of Bush's second term, Gore even made a short video in which he drew comparisons to a speech made by Oliver Cromwell over 300 years earlier. As the Bush administration seems to be coming to an end, it has been long, 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 long. One feels that he has not had enough of those naps with that little pillow that he sleeps with, touching picture. There's a famous moment when Oliver Cromwell is trying to get rid of Parliament, the long Parliament which in England was delaying the Protestant uh, victory. And speaking as Lord Protector, he said, you have stayed here, gentlemen, longer than you deserve. You have taken up our time. You have caused great harm to the state. And I am here to summon you to say now in the name of God, go. I am here to say go to the Bush administration. In the 2008 presidential election, the Republicans chose John McCain as their candidate, and the Democrats were split for a time between Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton, until Obama was officially named the Democratic candidate in June of 2008. Gore appeared on the BBC show Hard Talk in May of 2008, at 82 years old, to discuss the outgoing Bush administration and the upcoming 2008 election, among other things. And Hard Talk it certainly was. This interview with Stephen Sacker is one of the most antagonistic interviews with Gore Vidal I have ever heard. Let me begin uh, with this year's American presidential election. Do you care? Who wins the White House? I don't take it personally, no. I don't really care that much. Does it matter? Yes, of course it matters. It matters to everybody. We have had an aberrant government for quite some time now. You must remember the current president has never been elected by the people. Mr. George W. Bush is, uh, was anointed by the Supreme Court most illegally re-elected due to a stolen election in Ohio in 104. And he's not even legitimate. And yet he goes marching around, I'm wartime president, I'm wartime president, I'm wartime president. Well, he isn't one. He's making wars as he goes along. And he knows that's where the power is, the power of the military, procurement. And I think he thinks it's fun. I think he thinks these are toy soldiers he's playing with. Do you believe that um, when you say these things, most Americans have sympathy with you, or are you talking to a very, very small number of people I've inside the United States? I've got to warn you about something. I am very popular. Just get over it that I'm some sort of aberrant who goes around saying unpleasant things about who happens to be the president. Unfortunately, I have to occasionally. And that is how we're going to try and find out where we are in the world. We were lucky to get two pretty good candidates on the Democratic side for this election, and one of the most incredibly awful ones, the Republican Senator McCain, 
who really, you remember Mr. Magoo, blind, misses the point to everything, and is always, you know, stepping off a cliff. Senator McCain is Mr. Magoo. I, I want to ask you, if I may, about Obama, though. Obama, and again, I'm looking back at something you wrote quite recently. You said he's fresh, but he hasn't done anything, and you can't win with cliches. Do you think that is what he's trying to do? Well, I think that is an absolute truth that I expressed. No, but the point is, is, is it cliches that he is... Well, mounted? I don't see anything else but. I mean, it's standard political rhet rhetoric for a liberal from Chicago in a, in a race for president. People have compared him to JFK. They say his, his well, rhetoric... Well, Jack was can... not the greatest statesman of all time. But he was certainly a rhetorician who could energize, electrify the American public. No, I don't think you weren't there then. Well, I, I he, wasn't he, around at the time, but I've certainly seen his speeches since, and they were quite extraordinary, as indeed one could argue are some of Mr. Obama's. Well, yes, so what? A good speech is a good speech, that's that. Yeah. What's a policy? What's a good policy? Was Jack's invasion of Cuba a good policy? Was his uh, jacking up the war in, the, in Vietnam? Well, for a thousand days, this, this is enough bad act activity on his part. So, I, you know, he's not a paradigm to refer to. But if Obama wins this nomination, as he's almost certain to, will not, you change your mind about him? Well, I have nothing to change. I'd be perfectly happy if he were elected president. Well, uh, you don't I've, want a man mouthing cliches in the White House. You want a well, man, when you was say, there ever anything else policy. but? Let me ask you to take a step back, if you would. <laughs> You've been an observer of politics, not a player, and yet in your career, earlier in your career, let's say in the late 50s, early 60s, you could have been a player. The Democrats wanted you. Uh, you ran for office once, and then you were offered what looked like a safe congressional seat, but you decided not to do it. Do you regret that? No, because I was writing books again. and That's far more important than serving in Congress. Is it? Yes, it is. Do books make more of a difference than serving your country in, in the Congress? Do you know what that entails? I'd like to take you on the floor of Congress one day, and you see outside all the lobbyists lined up, and they have a buzzer, and this is the House of Representatives, and the buzzer is going off, which means there's about to be a vote call. And as you go in, two or three lobbyists will say, yes on 147, yes on 147, no on this one. They're getting their orders from the people who've given them the money. No, you can be pure and not be bored. It's a rough fight. And I, I would rather take on those who are out to destroy the republic, like the gang currently involved but, um, in management. But with, if your weapon is a novel or an essay, what difference can you make? I seem to have. But you care about the United States of America. Well, why do I talk about it? Why do I care about it? Why am I talking to you about it? It's not that I... Uh, I'm exhilarated by sitting here. <laughs> no, no, I suspect it's not. But <laughs> Gordon, well, what is the answer then? Why do you, and why have your career, have you spent most of your time writing about the ideals that uh, brought America into being, about its, its history? Shouldn't somebody do it? You see, I'm interested in the country. I'm not interested in me or my career. All the other writers I know about, that I know anything about, at least the American ones, are only interested in, in themselves, in making it. I couldn't give a goddamn about making it. Didn't stop you being very waspish, some would say bitchy, about your fellow writers. I mean, if you didn't care about your I personal standards... I hardly standard... ever mention them. I only write about them occasionally as a critic, always to praise. But, well, I mean, is it apocryphal that when Truman Capote passed away, uh, you described it as a good career move? Yes, I did say that. And well, I think, well, it that's was. That's the sort of comment I'm driving at. Didn't, didn't you want to say that no, so what, when, what when I a friend of yours receives praise, it, so a little bit of you dies? The complete quote is, whenever a friend succeeds, a little something in me dies. Well, I am funny from time to time. And, and I, I suspected you'd tell me it was a joke, but, but well, isn't there a little bit of seriousness under that? A, a sort of insecurity, a, a no. defensiveness? Oh, yes, I'm so insecure, you know. I'm jittery with insecurity. Uh, that number doesn't work. Corbett, we're, all, we're almost out of time. I, I, I just wonder... Yes, we are, in every sense. <laughs> <laughs> and before time closes down on us, tell me, do you think you are swimming with the tide of American history? Or if I were, I would reverse. So you're a contrarian. Come what may, you're a contrarian. 
No, I'm practical. I think the United States is going out of business, and I don't enjoy that. Henry Rollins also brought up the fact that at 82 years old, Gore was perhaps thinking of retiring as an author, although he did it in a much more respectful way. You've had an in incredibly uh, prolific career, novel screenplays, essays. Um, what does the word retirement mean to you? <laughs> Death. <laughs> You know, if you're a writer for life, it's unlucky to be one, and I am one. But you can't stop. You just go on and on and on. And then one day, uh, the light goes up. So in 2007, with no money in the, in the bank, and a president that seems to find enemies everywhere and want to start fires all over the world, uh, the idea of empire, to me, at least, is that thing that crumbles and eventually falls over. Well, of course it does. And so where do you see America in that situation? Well, I, I have predicted that it'll take two generations to get the Republic back, which the Bushites got rid of. If we had a non-corrupt media, the media, that was the media's task to explain this to people, but our media is totally corrupt and uh, totally in the service of the Bushites. The judiciary should have spoken out against the loss of the Bill of Rights. They all want judgeships. So they're waiting for a president, a corrupt president, to make a corrupt lawyer a federal judge. So they don't speak out. Who does? Writers for life. Biggest fools on earth, I can testify. <laughs> <laughs> Gore Vidal died of pneumonia on July 31st, 2012. He was 86 years old. He was buried next to his lifelong companion, Howard Austin, in Rock Creek Cemetery in Washington, D.C. But as death is rarely happy or fun, I thought we would end this series listening to an interview that Gore did a few years before he died, an interview conducted by a man who never asked the easy questions and often didn't know who it was he was interviewing. Here is Gore Vidal's 2004 interview, with Ali G. Booyakasha, check this out. I is here with my main man, none other than the boss man, Mr. Gore Vidal. Today we is chatting about history, innit? Because you better learn about it. Is history happening all the time? We are history. We, I, we can't help it. When I was 14, I fingered this girl called Ruth Jonas, and she found out that me was letting people sniff me fingers for 10 pence. And she told me that I was history. Is I history? Well, you were history for her. For real? So what does that mean? That means as far as one person on earth goes, you are historic. What was the Constitution? It was a written document outlining how the government of a new country should be governed. So why did they decide to write the Constitution on those two tablets? No, not on tablets, they're on paper. Didn't they mold up the... No, them that's, two th that's Moses. So, all right, so how involved was Moses in the Constitution? He had nothing to do with the Constitution. So is the Constitution the same now as it was back then? <laughs> no. It, what? Uh, well, we have amendments. How we many of them has you got? We've got 27 amendments to the Constitution. Ain't it better sometimes to get rid of the whole thing rather than amend it? Because, like, we used to go out with this bitch called... And she used to always try and amend herself, you know, get her hair done in highlights, get, like, tattoo done on her body crease, you know, have the whole thing shaved. Very nice. But it didn't make any more difference. She was still a minga. And so, you know, me had had enough. And once we got her pregnant... We've said, all right, latest. That is it. Ain't it the same with the Constitution? Well, the Constitution has not yet been pregnant. Let's chat about slavery. Ain't a lot of movies about slavery basically racialist? Like, whenever them needs to cast a slave, them always choose a brother. Well, there were no white slaves... What? ...in America, in the United States... So couldn't it be argued that slavery is a bit racialist? Well, it was totally racist. So you is an amazing guy. You ain't just a historian and 
a writer and a speaker, you was also a world famous hairstylist. So let's just mm -hmm. ask a couple questions about that. That's Vidal Sassoon. That's not me. But that's what you go under no, no, as well. No, that's somebody else. I know him too. All right. So very nice man. But. All right. Well, these next few questions may make a little bit less sense, but just bear with me. So, if you could cut any first lady's hair, which one would it be? No, I've to, I've never cut any hair. That's Vidal Sassoon. Yeah. It was reported that, like most of Ali G's interview subjects, Gore was not in on the joke which was that he was actually being interviewed by a British actor named Sasha Baron Cohen, parodying a privileged white man's idea of black culture. But from what we have learned about Gore Vidal's acuteness and incisiveness, as well as the slim chance that he ever played the fool, I find that very hard to believe. Vidolatry is brought to you by We Own This Town. This episode was written and produced by me, with additional research by Joshua Reese. You can find more information about this episode at vidolatry.com. I'm Ryan Briegel. Thank you for listening.